Hi everyone, Todd Keppel with the Klamath County Museum here, a few minutes late, uh, still dealing with learning how to do Facebook Live. This program tonight is uh, being offered as a substitute for a program um, that had been scheduled for March 26 uh, by the Klamath County Historical Society. Uh, we had hoped to do this program last week and we weren't quite ready uh, technically to pull it off, um, having a few more challenges tonight, but I think we're we're um, off and running here tonight. I, I wanted to take a minute to say that it feels a little odd uh, doing a program like this at a time like this. We certainly are mindful of so many things that people in Klamath Falls and around Oregon and across the country are going through at this time. Uh, we know that uh, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, close to a dozen uh, coronavirus cases detected uh, found here in Klamath County and um, uh, many more across Oregon and thousands, tens of thousands across the country uh, with undoubtedly uh, more to come. We're mindful of families that are dealing with the loss of loved ones or those who are ill, uh, with people who have been displaced from their jobs, um, folks working in the medical, uh, the healthcare professions. Um, mental health uh, is an issue for so many people at a time like this. Uh, just a, a never-ending um, list of issues that people in our country and our community are facing. It's at a time like this when those of us who work in the museum uh, business and in uh, local history try to figure out something we can do that would be helpful and for the most part that's just to do what we do to share programs on local history and we hope that that uh, this program might help all of us have some sense of um, uh, normalcy again. Uh, at the same time uh, I've been wearing a bandana all week uh, just because I was persuaded um, by a program that I watched several days ago that we all need to be covering our faces. Whether we think we're ill or not, uh, we need to be covering up. Uh, I don't think that this is going to protect me from the virus, but I have come to appreciate uh, how much um, care we all need to take, understanding that any of us could be carrying the virus with, uh, without feeling any symptoms. And uh, as I understand it, uh, we're about to receive some new guidance uh, from our government that we all need to be covering up. So I encourage everyone to uh, do your part. I guess I don't need to cover up since I'm uh, here in my home, um, but I did just want to, to share that, uh, that thought with you. So here's what we thought we'd do tonight. Uh, I've got a, a number of photos uh, from the museum that I printed out. These are photos that were collected over a number of years by a local resident by the name of Bob Lewis. Uh, Bob was a longtime warehouser employee and uh, had a number of other odd jobs and pursuits uh, around town, uh, but he worked as a warehouser uh, mechanic for a number of years. And uh, over time collected hundreds of photos, mostly of logging and lumbering history here in the Klamath Basin. Uh, so we have uh, selected a few of those photos to share with you tonight. I hope this works. What I'm going to do is just put these photos in front of the camera and hopefully point out a few things. Let me state right now that I know that uh, there are many people in town that know a lot more about logging and lumbering than I do. Uh, I'm a fairly recent uh, resident of Klamath. Uh, I moved here about 30 years ago. I grew up in farm country of eastern Kansas. So I never pulled greed chain and um, never felled a very large tree and uh, have not really worked in the industry at all. But I've talked to a lot of a lot of folks who have and so I'll share what little information I can uh, from these photos and I hope to be able to monitor some comments on Facebook I'll see if I can make that work do two things at one time here we'll uh, we'll see how it goes so bear with me and let me put this photo back in front of the camera and then I'm gonna move back around behind the camera where I can point some things out and uh, also check my status here um, I'm going to check my laptop and see if I can figure out whether we're getting uh, any comments. I see a lot of comments uh, from people who are saying, okay, where are you? So uh, sorry about the delay uh, there. And um, still checking my laptop here. While I'm checking the photo that you're seeing, um, Uh, well, I'm hesitating because uh, um, 
my laptop seems to indicate that something has gone wrong with the video. Hmm. Well, we'll continue to, um, to move along here while I continue to monitor my laptop and see if we can figure out what the status is of our program. I'm getting a few comments here. Uh, thanks, Chrissy, for checking the sound uh, for me. And Kate, it's good to see that you've uh, chimed in as well, too. Uh, so here's the green chain at Warehouser. Uh, massive operation, the, um, uh, described as the biggest lumber, pine lumber operation in the world. Now, I will have to tell you that um, I don't know whether that has been confirmed or not um, um, by uh, the proper authorities. But... Um, as far as we know, it's never been uh, disputed. A uh, large lumber mill that opened in uh, 1929, I think it was, about four miles southwest of downtown Klamath Falls. The green chain here that you see here is where fresh lumber that had been sawn in the mill was uh, being sorted uh, into uh, various grades. Uh, a number of people uh, love to talk about how um, they got their first job in the business uh, pulling green chain. And uh, so this is uh, the biggest green chain that ever would have operated in uh, the Klamath Basin. Well, getting a lot of comments from people now saying that they can hear and see the pictures all right. So it looks like we're off and running. Thanks so much uh, for that uh, feedback. Okay. Uh, here's another picture from the Bob Lewis collection. This is one that we showed in... Uh, the newspaper, as well as on our Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. This is from the Bob Lewis collection. It's a picture taken above the downtown area looking out across Lake Iwana. And uh, in the middle ground of this photo here, we can see the Big Lakes Lumber Company uh, on Lake Iwana. And off here to the right is the Iwana Box Factory. Hidden in the steam here coming up from the power plant would be the... Um, the slab burner, the 85-foot tall tower where waste products were burned. That tower is still standing even though almost all of these structures have disappeared. I think this stone masonry building, a part of that is still standing down on the edge of the lake. So just another picture here from the Bob Lewis uh, collection. Bob has a number of pictures from early day uh, lumber operations in Klamath Falls. This one shows the first lumber mill operation in the town of Klamath Falls. This is on Link River and a mill that was established in I think it was 1877 by William Moore. This is just below the falls for which the town of Klamath Falls is named. These are the falls such as they were, a set of low wide falls in Link River. But uh, there is enough uh, water power from a canal that ran along the edge of the river here to power this lumber mill from 1877 until uh, just after 1900 when Mr. Moore's sons, Rufus and Charles Moore, took over the business. And then in the early 1900s, they moved the operation uh, down Lake River, actually onto the west shore of Lake Iwana. And this is the new Moore mill. This would be the lumber mill here. Logs would be brought in from the lake up the, uh, the slip, it was called, into the mill and we can see stacks of lumber here uh, for drying. This is Link River emptying into Lake Iwana, and this cluster of buildings here is in the area that we would now, now call Moore Park, or excuse me, Veterans Park. Uh, this building here is the Baldwin Hotel in this beautiful uh, wintertime scene. Uh, we can see the old high school, Klamath County High School up on the hill, and another landmark here to the right, the old elementary school. All right, so trying to get the hang of this here. This mill was out on Long Lake, about, I don't know, what is it, probably 10 miles west of Klamath Falls, an early day operation. Uh, I've never been to this particular spot, but it's interesting to see this photo in the uh, Bob Lewis collection. This very typical of so many mills would have operated out in the Klamath Basin in various places. Every uh, little valley uh, in the hillsides or in the mountains around uh, Klamath County uh, would have had a mill similar to something like this. And in those early days, it took a lot of horsepower 
in order to maneuver logs uh, out of the woods and yard them into a place where they could be uh, hoisted by big wheels and hauled to the mill. In this particular case, we're seeing a set of uh, looks like four big wheels at a landing next to a railroad. The logs that we see in the background, I believe, are loaded on rail cars. But uh, these big wheels is what it took in order to move these heavy logs around. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. In this particular photo from the Bob Lewis collection, we see teams of horses that are dragging logs up to a place where they can be rolled up onto rail cars. Whenever I look at photos like this, I just imagine how dangerous the operation was. Uh, you see a couple of guys here on the left with uh, tools called cant hooks that were used to maneuver the logs around just using uh, muscle power to get the logs loaded. Every major logging operation would have had to have an entire crew of uh, men working with the horses. Uh, these horses could work for some hours but could not work all day uh, without wearing out and so there would have had to have been many teams of horses. Uh, an entire operation to itself with uh, a lot of hay and oats that would have had to have been a part of the equation there. Eventually, um, internal combustion engines allowed machinery to take the place of the horses. So here we see uh, an old, uh, probably a caterpillar tractor pulling a big wheel here. And I will say just a little bit about big wheels, maybe skating a little bit on the edge of my knowledge here about how these operations worked. But uh, the front end of the load of these logs could be hoisted up off the ground. That's why you needed big wheels in order to have enough clearance here to lift logs off the ground. The back end of the logs would have been dragging on the ground, but the front end would allow uh, horses or a tractor uh, to move the logs much easier and the big wheels would allow um, passage over some pretty rough ground. So we appreciate the feedback we're getting here. I can see uh, various um, uh, likes, thumbs up coming up on the screen. So if uh, that's you chiming in, whoever you are, uh, we appreciate that. So eventually, um, another transition or evolution in equipment and technology came by the way of trucks that were used to haul logs. Trucks eventually taking place of uh, much of the work that had been done by horses and somewhat by caterpillars and uh, eventually uh, by railroads. The Bob Lewis collection includes a number of interesting photos of rigs that look like they must have been pretty interesting to drive. A lot of GMC trucks. I used to know what this symbol stood for and it escapes my mind now. So here's a quiz for anybody that might be watching this and who knows uh, what that symbol stands for. It's the brand of truck um, I just can't think of it at the moment, so I hope someone can chime in with that. But, boy, look at, uh, I, I wish I knew how they got this truck loaded in such a way with nothing but a, a wrapper here, a chain. Uh, looks like a chain, maybe a cable uh, holding that log, a uh, load of logs together. Well, here's a picture of the guy who put this collection together, uh, Mr. Bob Lewis. Uh, grew up here in the Klamath Basin, uh, known by a lot of folks. Uh, he's seen here at the Sycan shops that Weyerhaeuser had out uh, by the little community of Beatty. And uh, so Bob's job uh, by day was to work on keeping these operations, uh, these trucks rolling. Uh, but his hobby uh, was to collect these photos. And uh, we're just so happy uh, that he did. Uh, looks like we've got some family members uh, that have uh, tuned in watching us tonight and uh, looks like somebody uh, uh, is uh, the daughter of Bob Lewis, Beverly Smith. So uh, thanks for uh, tuning in tonight and watching uh, Beverly. Uh, somebody said that that was a Mac truck. Is that right, Mac? I, I guess so. I was thinking it was something else. But anyway, here's the fellow that collected the photos. So Bob, thanks so much. Uh, we have two museum volunteers who knew Bob. Uh, Cliff Ambers and Bob An uh, Bill Anderson have um, actually helped bring this photo collection into the Klamath County Museum. Nearly 1,500 photos uh, collected by this man. 
and um, Cliff and Bill, both of them uh, warehouser retirees, went through every one of the photos and tried to identify any that uh, Bob had not made any notes on. And so we're grateful to the uh, volunteer time that Cliff and Bill uh, put into this. So, Bob, thanks for the photos. Uh, Bob Lewis had a particular interest in a mill just north of Klamath Falls um, that we know now as Algoma. But before the Algoma mill was there, we have a note here that this is the D.B. Campbell mill, 1910 to 1912. This mill was on the site where later the Algoma Lumber Company would establish a large mill operation. And uh, Bob had a particular interest in that mill because his father worked at the um, Algoma Mill. Uh, pardon me for being a little clumsy with the camera here. I don't have a great tripod on my tabletop here. But here's the, uh, the, the old Campbell Mill. In the background of this photo, you can see the um, Southern Pacific Railroad line going across here. That's the, the dike that the railroad was built on and where it still exists today. Uh, in 1950, they put in a new highway that ran just parallel to the railroad. So we know this photo uh, taken right around that time when uh, the railroad was being built. In fact, it looks to me like the dike ends right there. I'm not sure if I'm seeing that right or not. It looks like there should be equipment right there where they're building, uh, building that line. But anyway, this was the mill that uh, was on that spot before Algoma came in. Now here's a picture, one of many pictures in the Bob Lewis collection of the Algoma mill. Uh, this is such a fascinating photo. It's a pretty early photo in the life of the Algoma mill. Uh, we know that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that there's not as much building activity off here to the side of the mill as there was in later years. But we also, um, well, let me first talk about something that's in the background of this photo. We see here uh, a log train, a long train of loaded cars, loaded with logs that have come in. All of these logs came from the backside of Nalox Mountain. This is the mountain ridge that you see here in the background. And one of the fascinating things about the Algoma, Algoma Lumber Company operation is how they got the logs to come from the backside of the um, Nalox Mountain down here to the flats and across the valley and uh, into, the, into the mill. Um, the way they did that was with something called um, an incline railroad. And you can actually see where that incline was. This white line that you see coming down the hillside here was actually a rail line that the Algoma Lumber Company built. And they would lower rail cars one at a time down this incline and then assemble the train at the bottom of the hill and then bring them across the valley and into the mill here. We'll show you a close-up of that picture here in a minute. But I also wanted to point out in uh, this particular picture, this oval-shaped um, lay, uh, layout on the ground here. Um, this is something that was very distinctive for the Algoma Lumber Company mill. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe these were the office buildings over here. This is probably the machine shop where the millwrights would have worked out of. This is the hotel for worker housing. But this oval here was just a, kind of an interesting ornamentation uh, here uh, in the mill. And we'll see that in a couple of our other photos that we're going to look at. Oh, a couple of questions. One question that's come in, whether uh, from Susan Kreisenbeck, uh, has anyone published a book on the history of the lumber industry here? Um, yeah, we're going to take a look at a few pages from a book by uh, Jack Bowden, uh, Railroad Logging in the Klamath Country. It's an amazing book with some tremendous information. Uh, also, uh, Elaine Smith joining us from Australia. Hey, thanks for um, for uh, tuning in here and watching us all the way from the other side of the, uh, the world. Some great comments coming in, so appreciate hearing that. All right, so we're going to talk more about the incline here on Nalox Mountain, and then we'll be looking for further signs of that oval shape there. So here's an aerial view of the Algoma Mill. We can't see the incline railroad. It's off, uh, off the corner of this photo here. 
But there are a number of things we can see. We can see in the lower portion of this photo the Southern Pacific Railroad main line that went along the east side of Upper Klamath Lake. Uh, this is just basically along the shore of the lake, and the Algoma Mill was just off the shore of the lake. And so we can see they had a great connection here. Uh, actually, all major lumber mills had to be built pretty close, or right on uh, a rail line. And if they could be on a main line, uh, so much the better. In this photo, we see logs that have been gathered up here on Upper Klamath Lake. More on that later. This is the log pond for the Algoma Mill. And so logs could either be brought in from the lake under um, through a channel under the railroad and into the log pond. Or uh, they could be brought in on the, the rail line from the backside of Nalox. So here's the mill operation here. Uh, the box factory, I think, is this part of the mill. Here we see stacks of lumber uh, for drying. Um, this, this area here covered as much as a half mile from where the mill sat all the way back uh, to um, the the main road, the highway. Uh, by the way, this is the old Highway 97. It was called the Dallas California Highway, uh, coming in from the edge of the photo here, uh, over Rattlesnake Point. Uh, employee housing here. Here's the hotel. The dry kiln is this area right here, where lumber uh, could be dried. Here's the spot I wanted to call your attention to. Here's that oval shape. We can see now that some young trees have been planted in that spot. Uh, question is asked what year these photos are from. Uh, JW, thanks for that, uh, good, that good question. Uh, the Algoma Mill started, I want to say, in 1914 and operated until World War II. In 1943, the Algoma Mill uh, shut down. So all these photos would be from that time frame, 1920s, 1930s, uh, maybe as late as 1943. So um, again, here's that oval. Let me show you what that oval looks like today. Uh, this is a photo that I just captured off Google Street View the other day. This is on Highway 97 headed north out of Klamath Falls and headed north towards uh, Hagelstein Park would be off there in the distance and so this road turning off right here is the Algoma Road and this clump of trees that you see right here is that same clump of cottonwood trees that we see uh, in this photo here this is the oval here with the cottonwood trees and let me readjust here so here's somewhat what those trees look like today you can go out there and still see those trees and in fact, the foundation of the uh, the old hotel is right behind these poplar trees uh, here on the right. Otherwise, there's not much left of the old Algoma Mill. The dry kiln was still standing as still as if uh, as recently as a few years ago, uh, but they've uh, they've all been uh, removed. Um, a mention here about the insurance maps um, from Ken Hartel. He points out that a great deal of detail can be seen. Uh, about these mills uh, on the old Sanborn fire maps, and that indeed is uh, true. Tremendous resource there, those old insurance fire maps. And a question about uh, what the purpose of the hotel was. We call it a hotel. Uh, they called it a hotel. It was really um, pretty much a dormitory for employees. Uh, some employees might have lived in, um, in uh, the houses up on the hill, uh, in this particular photo, we can see a good view of some of the employee housing, probably for married workers or um, maybe uh, bosses, crew chiefs, whatever. Uh, this one house sitting out here by itself was the uh, home of the manager of the lumber mill uh, complex. Uh, Bill Anderson, uh, Bill Gabby Anderson, one of the volunteers I mentioned earlier, reports that he's got a list of the people that worked there in the old days. And so that would be an interesting list to see. Maybe we can figure out a way to make that list available. So we mentioned earlier the Incline Railroad, and I want to show a kind of a close-up picture of that. Uh, first of all, we want to make clear that this is not the same as a log chute. Um, people sometimes think that we're talking here about the log chute down at Pokegama, southwest of Kino. A log chute is where you just send logs sliding down a hillside uh, one at a time. And uh, an incline railroad is where you have rail cars loaded with logs 
And in this photo, looking up the Algoma Railroad incline, incline railroad, you can see two cars that are passing in the middle of the incline. We've got what appears to me to be a loaded rail car that would be coming down the incline and an empty car that's being pulled back up to make another trip and also serving somewhat as a counterweight to the loaded rail car. But of course, these loaded rail cars would have weighed easily more than 50 tons, uh, probably maybe more than that. I'm, I'm kind of guessing there. But a tremendous amount of weight to control uh, running down uh, that side of that, that hill at an uh, incline of as much as 57%, which is um, amazing to think about. Uh, now, this locomotive would not have made that trip up and down uh, the incline. Um, they did have a railroad system up on the top of the incline, but once they got the locomotive on top, it stayed on top to uh, go get cars uh, from the woods loaded with logs. But um, only uh, the rail cars loaded with logs would have been brought down the incline. And so a separate loco another locomotive like this one would have been uh, used to gather up all the loaded cars and pull them across the valley over to the mill. Here's what the top of the incline looked like. Uh, you can see a lot of rail lines here where cars would have been maneuvered for positioning to go down the incline. The incline is just over the crest of this hill here. This is just right at the crest of the hill. Here we've got a steam engine, sometimes referred to as a, a donkey engine. That provided the power for controlling the cables uh, that would have lowered the rail cars down the hill. Uh, we've got water tanks here for filling uh, boilers. This one probably used to fill boilers on locomotives. It's got a spout here that was probably lowered to fill uh, locomotives. But we've got two other water towers here, probably to provide steam for our water for the main boiler for controlling cars going down the incline. Here's a few pages from Jack Bowden's book that we mentioned. Uh, this photo, uh, or this page from Jack's book, lists 37 companies in the Klamath Basin that used uh, railroad logging for at least part of their operation. Jack, uh, who passed a few years ago, did a tremendous amount of research in compiling this book. Many of these uh, companies that you see listed here had their own railroad uh, system, their own locomotives and uh, rolling stock, and so they would have had a crew, a rail crew, um, that was in charge of moving the logs into the mill, and uh, the numbers that you see here correspond to the list showing where these various operations, uh, railroad logging operations, were located around the Klamath Basin. As you can see, uh, quite a number of them covering nearly every part of the Upper Klamath Basin. Jack's book also includes a page that shows where the major mills were located right here in Klamath Falls, including a few up on Upper Klamath Lake, with the big one up there being um, uh, Pelican Bay, which is uh, where uh, Jeldwin operations are located now. And then farther down on his map, we see Lake Iwana here with downtown Klamath Falls here. This is the Southern Pacific Rail Yard here. So uh, we've got uh, the Ackley Mill, the Moore Mill, Big Pine, Big Pines, uh, the Iwana Mill, Shaw Bertram, Klamath uh, Veneer, Klamath Plywood, and of course uh, farther down here, the Warehouser Mill. So uh, Jack Bowden's book is a great one. Sadly, it's out of print. Um, but if you have a chance to, to uh, find his book on eBay or Amazon someplace, Railroad Logging in the Klamath Basin. Uh, I think we might have a couple of copies of that book uh, for sale at the museum. They run $50, so they're a little spendy. But, boy, if you have any, any interest in, in the logging history at all, it's uh, well, well worth it. So uh, if you were going to load uh, logs under a rail car, you need some pretty heavy-duty equipment. Uh, to do that and so here we see uh, the device uh, that was used to load those logs onto uh, rail cars. Uh, McGifford I think is the name of this uh, device here. There would have been several of these machines operating in various places around the Klamath Basin. It would have had a steam engine inside the main framework here and then of course this boom to swing around. Uh, it, it could rotate around to pick up logs on the side of the railroad and then hoist them up onto the
car. So a major piece of equipment um, necessary for all rail logging operations. Eventually, trucks came to take the place of railroads. This is another photo that's related to the Algoma Lumber Company operation. These show trucks that would have been loaded up on um, what they refer to as uh, the Yawkey track, Y-A-W-K-E-Y, Yawkey was the name of a, a, a tract of timberland uh, just south and east of Crater Lake National Park. Algoma Lumber Company acquired uh, that piece of timberland up there and hauled many millions of board feet of lumber uh, off of that tract. They used the Up to Grave Brothers logging, uh, truck logging operation as a contractor to haul those logs from the Yawkey tract. Uh, not to the mill, but actually in this particular case, these trucks took the logs down to Agency Lake. And at some point, uh, I haven't learned where this point is. If somebody knows, I'd love to learn this, where this spot was, where the up to grave trucks would dump their logs into, lake, uh, into Agency Lake. So here we see loaded uh, log trucks that have come in and a boom was used to lift the logs off the truck and send them uh, rolling into the river, uh, into the lake. Uh, this, I believe, looks like Pelican Butte in the background here. So once the uh, trucks were at the edge of the lake, um, a photographer, I believe this was the Kennel Ellis Photo Studio, took these pictures that shows logs rolling down off the truck and splashing into the lake. We've got a couple of pictures that show that action. Another truck uh, being unloaded here into Agency Lake. Uh, sorry, got my photos out of order here. Once the uh, logs were in the lake, then they would be bound into a raft with upwards of a million board feet of timber uh, loaded together uh, into the lake, uh, into the raft, with uh oh, my phone died. <laughs> 